Hello and welcome back to another episode of Bing Woodworking. This episode I'm going to show you building this walnut conference table. Building this table I had some really really hard challenges and um, it was almost a complete failure or a catastrophe and in the end I want to hear your opinion whether you think this was a triumph or catastrophe. So first I got my rough sawn walnut. This is 6'4 walnut. That means basically an inch and a half. And uh, here I'm running it through my grizzly joiner. Trying to get a clean edge on one side so I can have a reference to, to use the rest of the material. Once I've done that I get a clean face on the side with the joiner. Run it through the planer and then over here to the table saw. So at this point, this is where I've started to wonder if I've got a complete catastrophe on my hands. I live a couple hours away from the nearest hardwood supplier, so I had to order wood to be delivered to me. And I ordered all heartwood walnut. As you can see from this picture, I mostly got sapwood. And I've already spent a lot of money on it. So I threw on some mineral spirits onto these boards, and I took a little video, took some pictures, and I sent them to my customer. And I told her, if you don't like this, there's no point in me going forward. I need to procure some more wood. Luckily for me, she said that she liked the contrast of the wood and for me to go ahead and go forward with it. So this is how I avoid a small catastrophe or large catastrophe because it would have cost me about a thousand dollars more to get more wood to replace it. But by having a good line of communication with my customer, I didn't have to guess someone else's opinion about it and was able to get a green light from them to go ahead and move forward with you know, the time that it takes to do the labor on everything with the table and not wait until I deliver the table before I find out if they like it or not, especially when I'm unsure of it. So that being said, just customer service, I can't emphasize that enough when you're doing anything like this, is uh, good communication. So now I've done the mill work with the wood. I'm doing a glue up. You saw me use my biscuit joiner, do my biscuits. Uh, here I'm just gluing up my panel, getting everything to line up right. I'm going to use two main panels to assemble this table. This is the first one. Use my parallel clamps and a, a call to get everything to line up. The call that I'm using or rather the calls are these square tubings that I've gotten that are metal and I found them to be more reliable than wood because you don't have the bow that you might get from wood especially softwood the two by fours or the pines they just don't cut it I always regret using them when I try to use them as calls honestly I need to cut down some scrap hardwood and make some hardwood calls I just haven't got around to that yet and speaking of pine or softwood calls You'll see here in a little while uh, why I mentioned that and something similar to it. While gluing up the first panel, I had a delivery that I had ordered online of these four-way clamps. I've always been fascinated by them, thought they would be the perfect answer for getting a flat panel glue up. Because I mostly make tables and getting little imperfections in my glue up is one of my pet peeves that I'm always having to correct and always having to put extra time into. So these four-way clamps came with instructions on the rip-down two-by-fours and assemble them as you see here. Now I should have used hardwood because the more pressure you use the more bow you get out of a four-way clamp and if a four-way clamp bows then it does little to no good. Which is why you see me using a hand plane here to knock down the shoulders on an imperfect flat panel glue up. Notice up in the upper right hand corner there's a big void there in the wood. The, the plank that I wanted to use came to an end there and uh, the grain that I wanted in that wood for the rest of the table was great. So I decided to use that wood and fill in that void with some epoxy. Uh, so here I'm just using my brand new Wood River plane, hand plane to get myself a hefty workout and work down 
this table. I started on the bottom. This is the bottom that we're looking at. And then I, once I had everything dialed in and more accustomed to my hand plane, I flipped it over to the top and started working on that. There wasn't as much work on the top, thankfully. Just this one seam where I glued up the panels. And if you're not aware of this new sandpaper that's come out, man, this thing is a game changer. I thought once that I got this sander that it was a game changer, which it was. But putting this sandpaper on this sander makes short work of what generally is the longest step of my table making process. And it, it honestly, it still is. But I cut down a 15, 16 hour process of sanding the top and bottom of a table by at least half. Simply by using this combination of my Festool Rotex and this new sandpaper. It really is an amazing combination. It does a really good job. I still use the old trick of using pencil marks on the table. If you look closely, you can see the pencil scribbles on there. So I can see where I've sanded and I can see everything that I still have yet to do and what I've already accomplished and I don't lose track of it especially if I get interrupted and have to go up to the house for any reason. Here I'm squaring up the edge of the table. I'm going to use my Craig track saw and uh, I was going to think this was a real good clip for showing you the track saw and then my body blocked the camera angle so you get to see me use it on the other end of the table instead of the close end. I really have enjoyed this Craig track saw. I think it's a really good buy and a really smart buy for the money. And remember that void I pointed out earlier. Here I have filled the void with epoxy, some deep pour, deep cast epoxy that's tinted black. And I'm sanding down the excess just to get it ready to finish later. So now that I'm done with the majority of my sanding and the other work, it's time to start thinking about the legs. Here I've made a template with some plywood and I'm using my plunge router with an upcut spiral bit to mill out the material that I'm going to use to put my legs in. The legs are metal with a faceplate at the top and this will help the table keep from racking or wobbling when uh, anybody sits at the table or rides on it or anything like that. Just a little bit more stability and uh, just helps an overall general appearance in my opinion. On these projects, when you think you're done with sanding, think again. I had several hours of more sanding to do as I go up through the grits. I won't make you watch more of this. Now I'm using my router with a roundover bit to round over the edges of the table and smoothen those corners and those edges. And now that I've got a plastic insert shield on the outside of it, the dust collection is really great on that. So here wait what what am i doing here let's see i'm scribbling pencil onto the wood oh gosh that means i'm about to do more sanding uh yep just like i thought okay so i will mention this with this rotex this festival rotex it's a beast man it's, it's a great machine but it's pretty hard to manage got a good learning curve on it and if you notice, I've got the hose up over my shoulder now. Well, this really helps balance this machine so that you're getting a good surface with the sander to the table. So this little trick has helped me out immensely. I'll pass it on to you. And now for my favorite part of every build and also the part that gives me the most anxiety. The favorite part is easy to explain. You get to see the colors pop, the grain come to life. For the anxiety, the reason why I have that anxiety is because if there's any little errors in sanding or if there's any imperfections that were not noticed before, they will become glaringly apparent at this point. And to fix those after this point is triple the work. You have to sand it down again and then start basically all over from the sanding process. So I'm using Rubio Monocoat on this, and you can see that cup that I'm holding, it only has maybe 20 milliliters for the bottom of this table, and it really goes a long way. It's very expensive. It's $80 for this tiny little jar, but um, 
it's completely worth it. I highly recommend it. I highly, I would endorse it if they'd let me, but, um, it just does a really great job of going on there. Not only is it beautiful, it's incredibly durable. I used it on a kitchen Island in my own house and it, it's still holding up great with high traffic, high use. So you spread it on there and then you buff it around and then you have to get the excess off. And it's all in a pretty quick succession. You have to do this in 15 or 20 minutes total or it starts gumming up on you and you really have to work harder to accomplish what you need to do. So this step made me extremely nervous too. I've ruined the table before by drilling all the way through it. I decided to do it on this step between the first and second coat of Rubio Monocoat to put these inserts in here. So um, probably could have done it before the first coat of Rubio Monocoat, but definitely don't want to do it after the second coat. Um, these I put in here as if I'm going into metal. When you're tapping into metal, you have to go in reverse a little bit to get the waste out of there so that you don't crack anything or put extra force that's unneeded in the area. After the first coat of Rubio Monaco, you use this little maroon pad. And right there, I just adjusted the suction on my dust extractor from Festool. You gotta get it just right or you'll be battling it. Anyhow, uh, going over it with this pad, you can see it gives it kind of a frosted look, a glazed look. It's really easy to tell where you've been. And keep in mind, throughout this entire video, most of the video that I've been showing you is sped up to a times two or times three configuration on the video. So I'm actually going much slower than this. I'm going about one inch per second, the same as I would do with regular sanding. And, uh, well, I won't make you watch the whole table. So now I'm putting on the second and final coat of Rubio Monocoat. Now, if you're listening, yes, the name of it is Rubio Monocoat, meaning one coat is all you need. However, there are some species of wood where a second coat definitely gives a good benefit. And this walnut was extremely thirsty and really sucked up this finish. So a second coat was needed. I was unsatisfied with the first coat and went about putting the second coat on here. So you buff it in with this pad that uh, Rubio puts out. You, know, you can use anything, but I decided to go ahead and use their product and see if I thought it was worth the money versus just using what I have in my shop. And I got to admit, it actually did work better and I'll be using this from now on. To buff it this time, I decided to use my automobile buffer that I have that I've never used on an automobile. I only have it for these projects. And I decided to use it because of the larger surface area. Trying to get a table this large all at once in the time that you need to manage it was a little difficult with the smaller surface area using my Festool. So using this, I was able to do it. And yes, I'm sorry. I do apologize for the red ribbon dancing in front of the camera. That's the pull string that I have for my retractable electric cord reel that I have mounted uh, to the ceiling of my shop. Uh, so when it goes up there, I don't have to jump to try to catch it. I just grab that pull string, pull it down. So my apologies. Now, uh, after I've buffed it, it's time to just make sure any splatter or little beads that are on there are wiped off before they uh, completely cure and harden up. So now I'm about to show you some things that I'm pretty proud of on this table. When I lined up these boards on the glue up, I paid attention to the orientation of the grain. Here I'm pointing out where the grain made it up with the board next to it to make the seam between the planks almost invisible in some areas. So where the sap comes together, I tried to match with the sap of other woods where the cathedral lines of the grain came together. I tried to match with cathedral lines of the grain. Here is the table after install in the customer's office. The customer is very happy and very pleased I was very happy and very pleased even though the look of the table is completely different from what I originally imagined. I wanted it all to be heartwood like that center plank you see in there and instead 90% of the table has way more sapwood than I was satisfied with. But in the end my customer was extremely happy which makes me happy and satisfied. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Please subscribe and like and I'll see you next time.